Uh, welcome back. Uh, here we go. We're going to go into, this is the second session of the DDR3 uh, design uh, tutorial. Uh, we're going to go into basically what I term safe routing practice. So here we go. The first thing is that when we look at safe routing practice, every stub looks like an LC circuit. Uh, by LC circuit, I'm, I'm saying that this can be a series uh, resonant circuit that if it is low in frequency, uh, it kind of looks like a capacitor. If it's high in frequency, it looks like an inductor. Uh, in between, it'll look like some combination of that. Therefore, you get funny reflections off these things. And the longer the stub is, the lower in frequency those things uh, come into play. So if you want to be safe about anything, then you have to have one continuous line from the driver through the receiver to the termination uh, resistor that looks like a single path. If it looks like it's got uh, Y's or stubs or T's coming off that path, those things will give you a problem. It just depends upon how high in frequency you go before that problem manifests itself. So as long as you keep those stubs very, very short, then at 2133 speeds, uh, you ought to be in pretty good shape. Now, in order to understand how short is short enough, I would recommend that you probably get yourself a simulator and sort of play with it a little bit to get some idea of what's going on. Now. A bigger issue that I run into is understanding what is a safe via. Now, when, when we talk about a signal via, let's say I've got a signal via that goes from layer 1 on an 8-layer board and it goes down to layer 8 on an 8-layer board. The signal via itself that's carrying address or uh, chip select or clock or something like that, that signal via is actually carrying only half of the circuit current. The other half of the current is called the return current. Now, just like if I had a, uh, a light bulb and a battery, I would have to hook uh, one side of the light bulb up to the positive side of the battery and the other side of the light bulb up to the negative side of the battery. The point is that the current, the signal current, has to return to the source. Now, if I was talking about uh, how that happens, the return current will follow the path of least impedance. Now, schematically, return current flows in the power and ground system. So when you see that little uh, ground symbol or power system, uh, power symbol, that's where schematically the return current flows. The problem is that the signal current and the return current are intimately bound by their electromagnetic field. Now, at lower frequencies, things just seem to work out because uh, it's not that big a deal. Basically, they are more sensitive to resistance than they are to uh, inductance or capacitance. But as you go up in frequency, these critical distances uh, become uh, uh, shorter and uh, the longer uh, critical distances, okay, at lower frequency, critical distances are longer, and capacitors still act like capacitors. Now, at high frequencies, critical distances are short, i.e., much less than an inch, and capacitors operate more like LC filters with all of their funny resonances. So, if you cannot explain precisely where the return current flows and why it flows there, you're gambling with whether or not your circuit will work and the odds are stacked against you. Now let me give you a couple of examples. For example, here is a via and it goes from layer 1 to layer 3 and L2, layer 2 in this case, is a ground. Now this is 1 megahertz, 10 gigahertz, this is 0 uh, ohms, this is 3 ohms. So in going up through, oh, say just above a gigahertz, it looks like I've got just a little bit over, or actually a little bit under, well, about one ohm. Call it one ohm. I've got about one ohm is the maximum uh, resonant peak that I will find 
in a via that goes from L1 to L3 that has a stub going from L3 down to L8, but it's going either side of the ground plane. Now, where does the return current flow? It flows, in this case, on the ground plane because that is a common power source for the driver. Ground is a common power source for basically all drivers that we will find in our circuits, whether they're 5 volt, 3.3 volts, 2.5 volts, 1.8, 1.5, you know, 1.2, etc. All right. So anyway, in looking at this, going either side of a single ground plane, then up through 1 gigahertz, the worst resonant peak I have is 1 ohm. And if I go up to, say, 2, 3, 4 uh, gigahertz, the worst peak that I've got there is about, I don't know, 1 point, well, 1 1.5, 1 point, well, it's less than 1.6 ohms. There's the 1.6 ohms. And at 2, 3, 4, 5 gigahertz, still that resonant peak is below 1.6 ohms. So the takeaway for this is going either side of a single ground plane is a relatively uh, easy and uh, non-damaging way to go route things, even though you do have a stub hanging down. Now, if I were to back drill this, this via, so if I back drilled back through, uh, say, layer 4, and so I didn't have the stub going from layer 3 down to layer 8, you'd find that most of these resonant peaks go away, and this becomes a very, a very simple sort of uh, via. So this is what I would term is a safe via, probably up to fairly high frequencies. Uh, fairly high, maybe, uh, say, 5 gigahertz. Uh, OK, now let's take another example. Here you go. Here I'm going from L1 to L3, and I'm comparing that from L1 to L8 with no stitch. So here's L1 to L3. You notice that here I'm always down around that, that 1 or 2 ohm. It looks like if I get out to 10 gigahertz, I'm all the way up to maybe 3 ohms as far as the resonant peak. On the other hand, if I go from L1 to L8, L1 its reference plane is going to be L2, which is a ground. And for L8, its reference plane is going to be L7, which typically in my designs are always going to be grounds. So if I go from L1 to L8, they're both reference to ground. But if the stitching via is a long ways away, say a couple of inches, then you'll notice that that is this green thing. And even down as low as 400 megahertz, you notice that I've got a resonant peak that's almost 32 ohms, and that's at 400 megahertz. If I get up here, uh, say around uh, one and a half gigahertz or so, I've got another resonant peak that's above 32 ohms. If I get up here to 8.8 .8 gigahertz, I've got a resonant peak that's around 72 ohms. Now, the takeaway for this is that if I take a 50 ohm transmission line and I add uh, 3 ohms to it, it makes it a 53 ohm transmission line. If I take a 50 ohm transmission line and I add 72 ohms to it, it's now 122 ohms at that frequency. If I come back down here to my 400 uh, megahertz range, uh, if I add 32 to 50, well, I'm up at 82. These are significant issues. So therefore, even if you've got two reference layers, uh, I mean two signal layers that are referenced to ground, you have to pay very careful attention to where are the ground-to-ground -ground stitching vias. So let's take another look at these things. Here I've got three different situations. I've got a via going from L1 to L8, L2 is ground, and L7 is ground. Now green is the ground, is the, uh, the, the L1 to L8, but the ground-to-ground -ground via is about two inches away. So there's that resonant peak that I'm seeing. And this first resonant peak, this is a log-log scale, so I'm getting that resonant peak at about uh, 200, 300, 400, uh, yeah, 400 uh, megahertz. I've got this resonant peak that's above 20, so that's my 32 ohm resonant peak. Now, if I take the same L1 to L8 via and I put a ground-to-ground -ground stitching via 50 mils away, that's the yellow line. So here you go, down here at the low frequencies. And now when I get up to 
about 200, 300, 400, uh, 500 megahertz, I have a resonance, but that resonance is only 2 ohms. All right. Now, why the difference between this resonant peak and that resonant peak? The difference is due to the ground-to-ground -ground stitching via. Over here, the ground-to-ground -ground stitching via was about 2 inches away. Here, it's about 50 mils away. Now, let's take the blue line. In the blue line, what I've done is I've got four ground-to-ground -ground stitching vias surrounding the signal via. So it's still going layer 1 to layer 8, but uh, this L2 to L7 uh, stitching via, I've now got four. So you can think of the signal via being here, and then one, two, three, four uh, stitching vias around it. And if you look at that, that looks pretty much like a plain old inductor of about 065 length. So you see there are no resonances in that whatsoever below 10 gigahertz. So if you make safe vias, you will have much more predictable results than if you don't have safe vias. When you have resonances like this down within your information band, uh, I can't tell you what that's going to do. At bare minimum, it's probably going to add a significant jitter to your design. All right, here is another picture of exactly the same information. This was on a log log basis. This one is on a linear linear basis and you see there is the case, the blue one, where I've got four each ground to ground stitching vias and that looks like a very good signal path. On the other hand, the green, there are those resonances that are there uh, due to the uh, stitching via being two inches away. Yellow, the yellow uh, resonances due to having just one at 50 mils. There's four ground to ground. So the takeaway on this is if you build good vias, if you build good interconnect paths, this is a much, much easier problem to go solve. So that's it for this section.